Nós, estudantes de Relações Internacionais da PUC São Paulo e integrantes do Grupo de Estudos sobre Conflitos Internacionais, em parceria com o Democracy Now, apresentaremos as notícias da semana. A partir de agora, vincularemos com legendas em português os principais destaques internacionais. From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! So, is it the most gravest moment in my life? Yes, but also in all of human history. And things like the election will have an impact on this. With the U.S. midterm elections a day away, we turn to the world-renowned linguist and dissident Noam Chomsky to talk about the elections, the possibility of a new nuclear arms race, and climate change. The uh, 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 Republican Party uh, is uh, uh, simply a major threat to not only to the country, but to human survival. I've said in the past that I think they're the most dangerous organization in human history for the, on the issue of climate change alone. But first we go to Florida, where a far-right extremist and self-proclaimed misogynist shot dead two women at a yoga studio in Tallahassee, Florida, on Friday, and critically wounded others. We'll speak with Soraya Chamale about the male supremacy movement. She's author of Rage Becomes Her, The Power of Women's Anger. The core of so many of these ideologies, whether you're talking about uh, what are known as incels, which are involuntary celibates, or, uh, you know, racist, neo-Nazi white supremacist groups, the, one of the fundamental um, ordinal forms of dividing people and controlling people is gender. It is the first order of dividing and controlling people. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The Trump administration's reimposed harsh economic sanctions against Iran, drawing condemnation from European allies and massive protests across Iran. The new sanctions officially began at 12.01 this morning, six months after President Trump withdrew the U.S. from the 2015 nuclear agreement that saw Iran win sanctions relief in return for abandoning much of its nuclear program. France, Germany, Britain and the European Union issued a joint statement Friday condemning the U.S. move, calling the Iran deal essential for the security of Europe, the region and the whole world. But European and Asian companies have largely cut back purchases of Iranian oil for fear of reprisals from Washington. The sanctions came just after Iranians celebrated the 39th ninth anniversary of the Islamic Revolution. This is Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. The U.S. is much weaker today than it was 40 years ago when the revolution was victorious. The power of the U.S. is on the decline. This is the important point. Most of the world's politicians and global affairs analysts believe that the U.S.'s soft power is worn out. It's being destroyed. On Friday, President Trump tweeted a photo of himself with the words, sanctions are coming November 5th written over his image, the words written in the font of the popular HBO program Game of Thrones. In a statement, HBO said, quote, it would prefer our trademark not be misappropriated for political purposes. In Florida, a far-right extremist and self-proclaimed misogynist shot and killed two women at a Tallahassee yoga studio Friday afternoon, injuring five others before turning the gun on himself. 40-year-old Scott Beerley had a long criminal history of attacking women, black people and immigrants via online videos and songs, and had previously been investigated for harassing women and arrested at least twice, once on allegations of battery against women. The victims of Friday's shooting were both from Florida State University, 21-year-old Maura Binkley and 61-year-old medical doctor and Florida State University faculty member Nancy Van Nessem. Maura Brinkley traveled to Washington, D.C., in the wake of the Parkland massacre in February to lobby lawmakers with Parkland survivors and their families. We'll have more on the Florida shooting after headlines. 
In election news, Georgia's Secretary of State and Republican gubernatorial candidate Brian Kemp announced plans Sunday to investigate Georgia's Democratic Party for cyber crimes related to an alleged attempted hack of the voter registration system. Kemp's office provided no evidence for the claim, which has been denied by the Georgia Democratic Party. This came just two days before the midterm elections, when Kemp will face off against Democratic challenger Stacey Abrams, who could become the country's first African-American woman governor if she wins. On Friday, a federal judge barred Georgia from rejecting ballots that don't conform to the strict exact match rules, where even a minor discrepancy in a voter's ID and their voter registration could prevent someone from voting. The rejections would have disproportionately affected African-American voters. Kemp was holding back more than 50,000 voter forms. Many have called on him to recuse himself as secretary of state while he runs for governor of Georgia, since the secretary of state oversees the elections. Meanwhile, President Trump and former President Barack Obama hit the campaign trail throughout the weekend, making a last-minute appeal to voters, speaking at a campaign rally for Indiana Democrats. Senator Joe Donnelly in Gary on Sunday, Obama took aim at Trump's lies and distortions. Because, unlike some people, I don't just make stuff up when I'm talking. I've got facts to back me up. I believe in fact-based campaign. I believe in reality-based governance. Joe Donnelly is one of the Democrats fighting to retain his seat in the U.S. Senate, along with North Dakota's Heidi Heitkamp, Florida's Bill Nelson and Missouri's Claire McCaskill, New Jersey's Bob Menendez and Joe Manchin of West Virginia, all Democrats. Meanwhile, reports show Kansas Secretary of State and Republican gubernatorial candidate Chris Kobach has received donations from white nationalists and has had ties with far-right groups for at least a decade. Kobach is in a tight race against Democrats. Democratic opponent Laura Kelly in what's considered a reliably red state. As Kansas Secretary of State, Kobach has come under fire after the sole polling place for Dodge City was moved outside of the town, disproportionately affecting Latino voters, not near public transportation. As candidates made their closing arguments, President Trump continued to rail against a caravan of Central American migrants crossing Mexico in order to seek political asylum in the United States. On Friday, the first of thousands of active-duty U.S. soldiers arrived at the U.S.-Mexico border in Texas, where they installed coils of razor wire on a riverbank and bridge. This is President Trump speaking at a campaign rally in Montana Saturday. We have our military now on the border. And and I noticed all that beautiful barbed wire going up today. It was a barbed wire used properly can be a beautiful sight. CNN reports Pentagon leaders rebuffed an order by Trump to have the military act as law enforcement on the U.S.-Mexico border. Such a move would violate the Posse Comitatus Act, which bars soldiers from taking on a domestic police role. Meanwhile, NBC is under fire for airing a racist political ad paid for by President Donald Trump's campaign during its broadcast of Sunday Night Football. The ad features a Mexican man, Luis Bracamontes, who was convicted of killing two California deputies earlier this year. In the ad, he's seen smiling and saying, I'm going to kill more cops soon. The ad blames Democratic Party immigration policies for the killings. But the Sacramento Bee reports Bracamontes was deported during the Clinton administration, later returned to the U.S. during the George W. Bush administration. In the late 90s, Bracamontes was arrested on drug charges in Phoenix, Arizona, but later released for unknown reasons under anti-immigrant Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Nigeria's military has pointed to Donald Trump's words to justify its deadly shootings of protesters last week in the capital, Abuja. 
Amnesty International reports more than 40 members of the Islamic movement of Nigeria were killed last Monday during a peaceful demonstration demanding the release of their jailed leader. The Nigerian military's official Twitter account initially posted, then later deleted a tweet reading, please watch and make your deductions. It was accompanied by video of Trump warning soldiers should shoot migrants who throw rocks. The United Nations is warning the U.S.-supported Saudi-led assault on Yemen is contributing to the death of a young child every 10 minutes. Gert Capillari of the U.N. Children's Fund, known as UNICEF, warned Saturday that a Saudi assault and blockade on the port city of Hodeidah is increasing shortages of food, drinking water and medicine. Today, every 10 minutes in Yemen, a child is dying from preventable diseases. Today, in Yemen, 1.8 million children under the age of five are suffering from acute malnutrition. 400,000 of these children are suffering the life-threatening form of severe acute malnutrition. The U.N. now says some 14 million Yemenis are on the verge of famine and 1.2 million suspected cases of cholera, over 2,400 cholera-related deaths since an outbreak began last year. The Trump administration continues to support the Saudi-led coalition with weapon sales, intelligence sharing and mid-air refueling missions for Saudi coalition bombers. The sons of the assassinated journalist Jamal Khashoggi have called on Saudi authorities to return their father's body to be buried in the Saudi city of Medina. Their appeal came as Turkish media reported Khashoggi's dismembered body parts were smuggled out of Turkey in five suitcases after Khashoggi was killed by a squad of Saudi hitmen inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul on October 2nd. In Pakistan, violent protests have erupted over the acquittal last week of a Christian woman sentenced to die for the crime of blasphemy. Asya Bibi spent almost eight years on death row until she was acquitted by Pakistan's Supreme Court Wednesday. Her lawyer has reportedly fled Pakistan in fear for his life. She was convicted of insulting Islam in 2010, after Bibi argued with a pair of Muslim women who refused to drink water from the same container as her. In Egypt. Gunmen fired on a pair of buses carrying Coptic Christians Friday, killing seven people, including six members of the same family, and wounding 18 others. The Islamic State claimed responsibility for the massacre in Minya province, south of Cairo. Egypt's interior ministry claimed Sunday its officers fought a battle with the gunmen after the assault, killing 19 of them. On Saturday, mourners at a funeral for the victims protested when a bishop thanked security forces for protecting their church. Scores of Egypt's Coptic Christians have been killed in similar attacks in recent years. In Afghanistan, the Pentagon says Utah National Guard Major Brent Taylor was killed in action Saturday after an Afghan army commando he was helping to train turned against him. Taylor was 39 years old, had taken a one-year leave of absence as mayor of North Ogden, Utah, to deploy to Afghanistan. His death came as the inspector general for the Pentagon's war effort reported Afghanistan's government continues to lose ground to the Taliban, with Kabul's influence reaching just over half of Afghanistan's district. Voters in the South Pacific archipelago of New Caledonia have rejected an independence bid and will remain in French territory. About 175,000 people were eligible to cast ballots in Sunday's referendum, which would have made New Caledonia the world's newest nation. Back in the United States, the Supreme Court ruled Friday that a landmark climate lawsuit brought by children and young adults can proceed in a federal court in Oregon. The 21 young activists launched their lawsuit under the Obama administration. They argue the federal government has failed to take necessary action to curtail fossil fuel emissions, violating their constitutional rights. To see our many interviews with the children, you can go to democracynow.org. A federal court has denied a bid by the Justice Department to halt a lawsuit accusing President Trump of violating the U.S. Constitution's ban on receiving bribes from foreign powers. The suit accuses Trump of violating the Foreign Emoluments Clause of the Constitution by receiving payments from foreign governments through the Trump International Hotel in Washington, D.C., and other establishments around the world. The lawsuit could force Trump to reveal financial records, including his income tax returns, which Trump has refused to make public. In New York, 26-year-old James Polite was arrested and charged with hate crimes Friday night. 
for vandalizing a Brooklyn synagogue and other targeted acts against the Jewish community. Polite scrolled anti-Semitic and racist messages, including Jew better be ready and insert oven here, on the walls of the Union Temple Synagogue in Prospect Heights, Brooklyn, Thursday evening, prompting the cancellation of an event hosted by Broad City's Alana Glazer. I was also due to appear at the event. She was going to interview me about coverage of the midterm elections. Polite is also charged with setting fires at a number of locations Thursday night and in the early hours of Friday morning. He was apprehended after setting a fire at a Jewish school in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, on Friday. According to a New York Times profile from 2017, Polite was raised in the foster system, struggled with substance abuse and mental illness, but developed an interest in politics, leading him to volunteer for Barack Obama in 2008 and then intern for then-City Council Speaker Christine Quinn. He reportedly worked on hate crimes, sexual assault and domestic violence while in Quinn's office. To see our interview with Broad City's Alana Glazer on Friday, go to our website at democracynow.org. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! And we will make America great again. As voters head to the polls today in a midterm election seen as a referendum on Donald Trump's presidency, with both houses of Congress in the ballot, we'll speak with Mother Jones reporter Ari Berman about the record 36 million Americans who voted early this year. This comes as a trial kicks off the challenges the Trump administration's move to add a citizenship question on the census, sparking fears of vast undercount in states with large immigrant communities. The census is supposed to count every person in America, non-citizen or citizen, and it's really a constitutionally mandated accurate count. So if the census is manipulated for political purposes or the count is done wrong, there's no way to fix that. Then we'll go to Colorado, where voters have managed to get a statewide anti-fracking measure on today's ballot. The oil and gas industry has spent tens of millions of dollars against it. And we look at the historic number of women of color running for public office in today's election. At least 255 women are on the ballot as congressional candidates, including a record number of women of color. In Georgia, Stacey Abrams hopes to become the state's first black governor and the country's first African-American woman governor. If we want deliverance against an enemy who is the architect of voter suppression right. in the South, right. if we want deliverance against someone who will lie rather than admit he made a mistake, Talk about it. if we want deliverance from someone who will lie to his friends and lie to his enemies, right. then we've got to vote our hearts out on Tuesday. That's right. We'll speak with Amy Allison, president of Democracy in Color and founder of She the People. And we look at Amendment 4 in Florida. If it passes today, it will be the largest enfranchisement of Americans since women got the right to vote almost a century ago. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Voters head to the polls today for a midterm election that's widely seen as a referendum on Donald Trump's presidency, with both houses of Congress and 36 governors' races in the balance. 36 million Americans voted early this year, with participation high among young people and people of color. That's up from 27 million four years ago, leading many to predict a record turnout for a midterm election. Politico's reporting glitchy voting machines in Texas and Georgia have caused some votes for Democrats to be switched for the Republican candidate or deleted. Experts have said the error is a technical malfunction. Voters in civil rights groups in Texas and Georgia have filed complaints in what are two of the most closely watched states this midterm election. In the final stretch of campaigning, President Trump appeared at rallies in Ohio, Indiana and Missouri Monday. He repeated his vicious verbal attacks on Democrats and Central American migrants heading toward the U.S.-Mexico border. You think we're letting that caravan come into this country? You can forget it. But the Democrats want to abolish ICE. They want America to be a giant sanctuary city for drug dealers, predators, and bloodthirsty MS-13 killers. Republicans believe America should be a sanctuary 
for law-abiding Americans, not criminal aliens. At his final campaign stop in Missouri Monday night, Trump was introduced by right-wing radio host Rush Limbaugh. He, Trump then invited Fox News host Sean Hannity to the stage. Hannity then addressed the crowd after he had promised earlier on the day on Fox he would only be covering the event as a journalist. Hannity immediately attacked the press. By the way, all those people in the back are fake news. Among those Sean Hannity pointed to were colleagues of his own network, Fox News. Meanwhile, backlash against a racist campaign ad Trump tweeted last week continued Monday. The ad features a Mexican man who was convicted of killing two California deputies earlier this year. In the ad, he's seen smiling and saying, I'm going to kill more cops soon, as the text on screen reads, Democrats let him into our country, Democrats let him stay. The ad also shows crowds of migrants pushing through a gated barrier, equating them with murderers. CNN refused the ad, calling it blatantly racist. NBC and Fox News agreed to pull the ad, though they did broadcast it to millions of people before. Facebook blocked the ad from receiving paid distribution after initially allowing it. When asked Monday about the ad, Trump himself tweeted last Wednesday, Trump denied any knowledge of it. I don't know about it. I mean, you're telling me something I don't know about. We have a lot of ads. And they certainly are uh, effective based on the numbers that we're seeing. Well, Mr. President, a lot of people have said that. Why did you like that ad? Well, a lot of things are offensive. Your questions are offensive a lot of times. At a campaign event for Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue described the stakes of the Florida governor's election Tuesday as being cotton-picking important at a campaign event on Saturday for Republican Ron DeSantis. He is seen, uh, clearly seen, as a racist remark. Meanwhile, in Georgia, Democratic gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams is accusing her Republican opponent, Secretary of State Brian Kemp, of abusing his power with cooked-up hacking accusations against the Democratic Party. On Sunday, Kemp charged Democrats with hacking voter registration systems, but provided absolutely no evidence. The last-minute probe is widely seen as an attempt to derail the Abrams campaign by twisting a concerned voter's complaint about alleged voting security issues that was sent to the Democrats, and they then sent it to Voter Protection, which is run by none other than Brian Kemp, who is the secretary of state, who is also the gubernatorial candidate challenging Stacey Abrams. This is Abrams. Once again, for the third time, he has put our voters at risk, and he has refused to take responsibility. The first two times, he blamed a vendor and an employee, and this time, he's blaming the Democratic Party. Brian Kemp has never once taken responsibility for his actions, and he should not get a promotion to a higher position, because he will constantly abuse that power as well. Meanwhile, Kemp campaign robocalls are repeating false claims that Radical Abrams is planning on stealing the election by allowing undocumented people to vote. Radical Stacey Abrams is so extreme that she wants to allow illegal immigrants to vote in this election. We can't let her steal this election. It's up to you to stop her. The Kemp campaign's official robocalls went out as a series of unofficial, explicitly racist robocalls targeting Abrams have also been reported. The calls are reported to be the work of white supremacist media group Road to Power, a warning this recording is extremely racist. This is the magical Negro, Oprah Winfrey, asking you to make my fellow Negress, Stacey Abrams, the governor of Georgia. Oprah Winfrey campaigned with Abrams last week. Road to Power is also responsible for racist robocalls targeting African-American Florida gubernatorial candidate Andrew Gillum. Students in high schools and colleges across the country are planning to walk out of class this morning at 10 a.m. to march to the polls as part of the Walk Out to Vote initiative. Organized by the youth-led network Future Coalition, students will go to the polls to cast ballots and, for those too young to vote, cheer on their older peers. A federal trial is underway in New York City that could overturn the Trump administration's plans to put a citizenship question on the 2020 census. Voting rights activists fear the question will deter immigrants from participating in the census, leading to a vast undercount in states with large immigrant communities. This would impact everything from the redrawing of congressional maps to the allocation of federal funding. Federal courts have ordered Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross to testify to his motivations in ordering the citizenship question. In July, U.S. District Court Judge Jesse Furman said it was 
plausible that, quote, Wilbur Ross's decision to reinstate the citizenship question was motivated at least in part by discriminatory animus and will result in a discriminatory effect, unquote. We'll have more on the fight over the citizenship question in the 2020 census after headlines when we speak with journalist Ari Berman, author of Give Us the Ballot, The Modern Struggle for Voting Rights in America. In more election news, Colorado voters will decide on a ballot measure that could restrict where new oil and gas wells can be located. Proposition 112 will bar drilling sites closer than about a half mile from buildings in vulnerable areas like parks, schools and waterways. Another Colorado measure backed by the fossil fuel industry, Proposition 74, would make it easier for property owners to sue for compensation if their property values are diminished by government regulation. Critics say Prop 74 would force taxpayers to pay companies not to frack for oil and gas. In Washington state, voters will decide the fate of Initiative 1631, a ballot measure that would make their state the first in the country to enact a fee on carbon dioxide emissions. The measure would force polluters to pay $15 per metric ton of carbon emitted starting in 2020, with annual increases of $2 per ton until Washington meets a target for greenhouse gas reductions. Fossil fuel interests have spent at least a record $32 million to defeat the Washington measure. Here in New York City, local leaders gathered at the African Burial Ground Monument on Monday to condemn racist graffiti found on a sign at the historic landmark last week that read, kill the N-word, with the N-word spelled out. Last week, anti-Semitic graffiti was found at several sites in Brooklyn, New York, including a synagogue in Prospect Heights. City Council member Jumani Williams warned yesterday of a, quote, atmosphere that's been created in this country, unfortunately, that's coming down to the city and this state, he said. This comes as ABC News identified at least 17 criminal cases where Trump's name or his rhetoric was directly invoked in connection with acts of violence. In Cameroon, armed rebels kidnapped at at least 79 students and their principal, according to local reports. The kidnapping in northwestern Cameroon was reportedly orchestrated by separatist fighters who've been calling for a secession of Cameroon's Anglophone regions, which they say are politically disadvantaged in the predominantly French-speaking nation. In Ukraine, 33-year-old anti-corruption activist Katernia Panziuk died Sunday from complications from wounds caused by an acid attack three months ago. Hansiuk was a prominent anti-corruption advocate and political advisor who spoke out against corruption in law enforcement agencies and the police's inaction in the face of increasing attacks on Ukrainian activists. Protesters gathered in five Ukrainian cities Sunday uh, to call for justice and a transparent investigation into Hansiuk's killing. Five men have been detained, but no one's been publicly charged with ordering the attack, human rights groups said. There have been more than 55 unsolved attacks on activists in Ukraine since the start of 2017. And this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Nosso programa fica por aqui. Você pode acompanhar a gente pela página no Facebook ou pelo blog Terra em Transe. Nos vemos na próxima semana. Até lá!